good day and welcome from our Women of Color Advanced Peace and Security Recaps Latin America and Caribbean Working Group uh, for this uh, monthly webinar. Today, we are very honored to join this event with the Center for Democracy in the America CDA. I have four uh, special guests today who are going to discuss the most pressing issues of the Latinx, Latinx community, uh, what they're facing, uh, how this may resolve, and how the administration should engage Latinx in the policy making process. So this session moving forward, how the Biden Harris administration may engage the Latinx community and what the future looks like, that's what it's going to be about today. WICAPS is a 501c3 organization dedicated to promoting the leadership and professional development of women of color in the fields of international peace, security, and conflict transformation. We at WICAPS believe that your voice is a critical addition to these topics. And thank you sincerely for your participation today in this virtual event by submitting your questions so that at the end of the conversation, we can answer them. Uh, our webinar is, is scheduled for one hour and 30 minutes. So we encourage you, all participants, to bring your questions, comments, anything uh, via Q&A box. Now, I would like to introduce our speakers and moderator for this panel. And um, so we're going to welcome Cindy Marisol Benavides. She's an Honduran American immigrant who has experienced the American dream and now devotes her career to public service, ensuring that countless young people, women and immigrants have the same opportunity. She is a currently chief executive officer for the League of United Latin America Citizens, LULAC, the oldest Hispanic civil rights organization in the country. She received her Bachelor of Arts from Virginia State University in Petersburg, Virginia, where she graduated valedictorian of her class and studied political science with a minor in Spanish. She also attended to American University for her master's degree in international affairs and is working on submitting her substantial research paper. Ivalice Barroa Garcia is the policy director of the Congressional Hispanic Caucus in the president of Congressional Hispanic Staff Association. Previously, she served as a legislative assistant for Congressman Raul Ruiz, MD, California 36. Prior to joining Tim Ruiz, she worked for Senator Barbara Boxer, Democrat, California. Avilis was born and raised in Lima, Peru, where she studied law at the Universidad de Lima. She is graduate of the University of California, Los Angeles, where she received a BA in political science. Welcome. Andrea Centeno is the regional council of Maldiv, Washington, D.C. office, where she oversees Maldiv's legislative and regulatory work in Washington and litigation work covering the U.S. Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia, Court and 11 circuits. Prior to attending law school, Andrea advocated for government transparency and accountability in New York focusing on election reform issues, and she received her GD from American University Washington College of Law MBA from Pitzer College. Welcome. So Jade or Jade Vasquez is a public policy professional with professional experience in the public and nonprofit sectors. Jade received her MA in global policy at the University of Texas at Austin Lyndon B. Johnson School of Public Affairs and her BA in International Relations and Spanish at Hobart and William Smith Colleges. Jay is a return Peace Corps volunteer who served as a youth. Development Special in Rural El Salvador from 2013 to 2015 during the height of the uncompanioned minor crisis. Last but not least, our moderator, Laura Muñoz, is the 2020 Stephen M. Rivers Memorial Fellow at the Center for Democracy in the Americas. She graduated magna cum laude from Brown University in 2020 with a Bachelor of Arts in History 
and Latin America in hiring studies with honors. She was previously a Congressional Hispanic Caucus Institute intern in the House of Representatives for a Florida Congressman. Laura, the floor is all yours. Good afternoon. Thank you everybody for tuning in and for joining us. And thank you to all of our panelists for being a part of this conversation. Before we get started, I'd like to mention a few housekeeping matters. First, this panel is being recorded and it will be available for viewing on the WCAPS YouTube page after the live event ends. Second, we're really looking forward to engaging with all the audience today, and we encourage you all to type your questions for our panelists in the Q&A section at the bottom of your screens. Later in the panel, I will read those questions out loud and give our panelists a chance to answer and engage with you all. So thank you. To begin, I would like to ask each of our panelists, what does Latinx mean to you? We're going to start off with Cindy. The floor is yours, Cindy. Thank you. Muy buenas tardes. Good afternoon, everyone. Un placer estar con todos ustedes. It's a pleasure to be here. And thank you so much for the invitation. And I'm so looking forward to this dialogue with my hermanas en la lucha, uh, my colleagues who would work every single day to make sure that the lives of our communities are improving across America and the entire hemisphere. And so as, as I think of that question, Laura, I will tell you that my relationship with the word Latinx is complicated. And, you know, part of my, my, my understanding of the word is one, you know, understanding how the word was created, how it's applied. Um, I will tell you that currently I am reading a book called Finding Latinx by Paola Ramos and really making sure that we understand that words matter. And um, as an individual that understands and speaks fluently Spanish and English, you know, understanding other languages is very important and also understanding uh, the genders the tied to our language is very important. And so, you know, as a Latino civil rights organization, uh, LULAC uses the term Latino, Latina, or Hispanic. And, you know, as I become more versed and understand the word Latinx a little bit better, um, I will see if I make the switch. But my understanding is at the moment, only 3% of Latinos only use uh, the term Latinx. Thank you, Cindy. Um, Ivelisse, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you so much, Laura. And it is a pleasure to see you all here. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, my name is Ivelisse Borroa, um, and this is a very fun question. Um, like Cindy, um, you know, I grew up in Lima, Peru until I was 19. So I immigrated to the US as an adult, and I was, you know, I went to law school there. and it's completely different to adjust to Latinx when you um, grew up using, you know, very gendered language in a foreign country, very conservative country. Um, so it is very complete. I have a very complicated relationship with the word too. However, um, it reminds me of this episode in One Day at a Time um, where the grandma, Rita Moreno's character is like, what is Latinx? Is it a Latino Phoenix? Um, and that is, you know, when, when I heard that, I was like, that's exactly how I felt about the word Latinx when I first encountered it. Um, and the more I have been learning about it, the more, you know, I, I talk to the members of uh, the organizations that I belong to, that I lead, um, the more I understand it. And to me, the word Latinx is about respect. Um, I myself identify as a Latina, but, um, it made me understand that there are, you know, folks in our community that identify as Latinx and they welcome it and they feel more comfortable because of the misogyny, the patriarchy, the, the colorism in our culture. Um, and that is okay. Um, and to respect the fact that, you know, they, they, they identify with that word is that I use it, you know, and to me, let's just call people what they want to be called. If they want to be called Latinos, Latinos. If they want to be called Hispanics, Hispanics. If they want to be called Latinx, then Latinx, right? And, and that's part of the respect um, within our community that we need to foster. So that's what the word means to me. Um, but again, I'm very grateful to be here with all of you. Um, so thanks for the question, Laura. Thank you, Ivelisse, for your reflections. Andrea, we would love to hear from you. Hi, good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, I should say. Um, Andrea Centino, it's a pleasure to be here with all of you. Um, I think, you know, for me, as I reflected on the word, 
and what that really means, you know, I echo the sentiments and the, you know, the thoughts of my colleagues in terms of, you know, being mindful of the language that we use. It's a good reminder of how language evolves and how, you know, the way that we describe ourselves as a community or as members of a community um, changes over time. And so, you know, Latinx is, you know, a reflection of, um, you know, language that seeks to be more inclusive. Um, and then I really think about what does Latinx mean to me? I mean, obviously the word, uh, you know, is reflective of trying to describe our, you know, population, which is over 60 million people in the United States. Um, obviously many, many more um, worldwide, you know, in the US we're about 18% of the population. So just if you're looking at the United States, it's a richly diverse population. We have, a, you know, a, we're a large country with a lot of diversity within it. Um, and so it's, you know, very much, you know, a, a um, reflection of trying to be inclusive of all the various identities that encompass or that are included within the Latinx population, whether we're talking about the United States or whether we're talking about, you know, more broadly globally in the hemisphere or across the world. Um, and I appreciate, you know, the, I guess, the evolution of the way that we describe ourselves, the way that we describe, um, you know, our shared um, heritage, but also, you know, the differences within that population. Um, and if you just look at the United States, you know, you have the unique stories of um, Mexican Americans versus um, Cuban Americans versus, um, you know, those from Central America, Hondurans, um, Salvadoreños, what have you. We're such a large population, but in a lot of ways, you know, it can be, um, it can, um, you know, it, it can be a catch all that, you know, sometimes um, is a little bit inadequate to describe how richly diverse that we are. And I think when we're talking about Latinx, it's always helpful to remember that we're really talking about a very, very diverse population that has unique history, unique stories, um, you know, whether that be, you know, talking about indigenous um, individuals, individual, sorry, Afro-Latinos, whatever it may be, and wanting to make sure that we're reflective of those various stories throughout. So, you know, Latinx is a very, um, as people have said, you know, it's a, it's a term that many people are getting familiar with and are getting uh, more educated about. But I also think that we have to be mindful of how we're using language to describe our population, the circumstances in which we're using Latinx and, and the circumstances where we need to be more specific about who we're talking about within the Latinx population. Thank you so much, Andrea, for your remarks. Jade? Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Jade Vasquez. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with you all. Um, I'm going to probably reiterate a lot of what has already been said. Um, you know, for me, Latinx is a shared identity, a shared culture, a shared history, and oftentimes a shared language. Um, I know Andrea said that, you know, we are very diverse uh, and multidimensional, but I also identify, you know, as a I was born in the United States, but I am Dominican and Costa Rican and Salvadoran uh, because I have two parents that are Caribbean and Central American. And so, you know, I do feel a strong connection with the Latinx community, regardless of, you know, where they're from. And so I think this shared identity, despite being so diverse, is still really important. Um, so I don't, I think it's important for many reasons to separate. Um, you know, us as, you know, our histories as, you know, Colombian or as a Salvadoran or as a Puerto Rican. But I also think that our identity as a Latino community is also very powerful. So I uh, also want to add that. I think the term Latinx, um, you know, it's, it's an American term. Uh, they don't use it in Latin America. Uh, and I think that's more of a reflection of you know, where we are, um, you know, and it's also a generational term, right? So a lot of millennials and Gen Z um, people use it. And so I think it's more of a reflection of our mission to be more gender inclusive. 
Um, and so I really appreciate the term. Um, and I think, you know, Latinos in Latin America may not be using the term Latinx, but in my conversations with the LGBTQ plus community in Latin America, they are, you know, they are changing the language to be more gender inclusive, right? So rather than saying bienvenidos, some people may be saying bienvenides. And so um, I don't, I know there's some resistance uh, within, you know, the Latin American community um, in the United States, right? They're saying like, we don't use Latinx. Um, I know Cindy mentioned that only 3% of people use it, but younger folks in Latin America are, are fighting back, <laughs> uh, are using uh, new language to be more gender inclusive. And so I think we should um, reflect on that as well. Thank you all so much for your reflections. Um, next, we have a couple of questions which anybody can answer in any order. Um, as Andrea alluded to, the Latinx community is not a monolith. There is major differences in the beliefs of foreign-born and U.S.-born Latinos, for example. There are also major differences among nationality groups, generations, and geographical areas. How can the Biden-Harris administration ensure that all Latinx voices are being represented and listened to during the policymaking process? And how can the administration work to ensure that Afro-Latinos, Indigenous Latinos, and Latinos with other intersectional identities are being represented as well? I can start. My and, and first, let me start by saying that my my views and opinions here are, you know, only mine and not the CHCs or Chasas. Um, so to me, it all comes down to tailoring an outreach, right? Tailor your message. Um, you're not going to go to a very um, you know, old guard, Hispanic or Latinx community in where they are religious and talk to them about gay rights or abortion, right? Uh, which are very key uh, talking points to, to Democrats. Um, you have to frame it around their beliefs and respect learn the culture, do outreach and respect the culture and tailor your advocacy, tailor your outreach, tailor your campaign to their communities. Um, in many communities, um, you know, in Texas or Florida, they're still very religious and their families are, you know, younger um, or older generations, like they just came to the US. They're new, newer immigrants, so to speak, if that makes any sense. They were not like their families have not been here in the US for, you know, generations and generations. No, they're like literally immigrants or the sons or daughters or children of immigrants. So um, that is still very ingrained in all culture and we need to use that to our advantage and still make a difference, right? And tailor the message um, and do outreach. A lot of people, we don't, we have a trust issue, I think as a community and um, we, in our countries, we're, you know, um, trained to not trust, not trust the government. Don't trust the person on the street offering you something. Don't talk to a stranger. And we just need to earn the trust of the community and they need to learn um, how they work, how they operate, what are the dynamics of that specific community and, and send the per recruit person from that community and send the person from that community to also do the outreach. Um, I think that's very important and that's something that, you know, we can use moving forward. And I'll jump in here as well, Laura, with that question. And, you know, I, I would say that the, the current administration has a lot of work to do. The truth is that for the last few years, our community has lived uh, with fear. Our community has unfortunately been um, persecuted by a standing precedent. We've seen the, the public charge rule and the fear that it's creating and accessing public services for our community. And, and I would also say that, you know, as we're thinking of the future, I, gosh, I just ran into a statistic where 50% of Hondureños want to leave Honduras. And so it, it talks about the importance of stabilizing the region and providing opportunities uh, within the different home countries, making sure that the level of education and workplace opportunities exist. And, you know, like I will tell you as an immigrant, as someone who was brought to the US at the age of one, um, that my parents came because they wanted opportunities for their children and they did not see it in Honduras. The other important factor was that they were seeing hate crimes increasing in my native homeland. And today, San Pedro Sula is one of the deadliest cities 
in the world. And so, you know, as we think of the work ahead, we know that currently the Biden-Harris administration is assessing the different policies that were overturned or that were creating within the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, we're already seeing some of the work from the administration, the, the difference in tone and tenor, and even in values and addressing the issues we're seeing at the border as humanitarian issues in making sure that there is due process for our immigrant communities. But the other thing I would point out is that we're living in a time that COVID-19 is disproportionately impacting our communities. And as we think of our communities and the fact that so many of them are surviving, they are literally at, 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 at the Manslow hierarchy pyramid. They're, they're trying to meet those basic needs. And what we know for sure is that our communities are experiencing um, not only a disproportionate impact of COVID-19 because five out of six Latinos have to leave their houses every single day to work and get paid, uh, but they also are experiencing high unemployment rates. And then you see the issues of food insecurity um, as well as financial insecurity. And what we're already seeing in our communities and we started seeing this trend last year is that our communities are self evicting from their homes because they don't want to end up in court. And, you know, I, I want us to be thoughtful of the fact that there's not only fear that's occurring, but our communities at this moment are trying to just survive. And when we speak to communities on the ground through our different financial relief projects through LULAC nationally, one of the stories that sticks out, and this story was actually a local story out of Northern Virginia. One of the mothers came up to one of our LULAC members and said, thank you. Thank you because today's decision was if I was going to be able to purchase uh, flour, tortillas and beans versus laundry detergent. And I want us to just reflect on that, that so many in our communities don't even have $10 to be able to purchase the basic staples for their families and for their communities. And so, you know, as I think of the opportunity ahead, uh, right now, you know, our Latino community is 18 plus percent of the population. In three decades, we will be close to 30% of the total US population. And what this means in the American context is that one in three Americans will be of Latino ancestry. You know, I'm also thinking, and I know Andrea, you did so much work around the census, but I'm thinking also of the impact of the census, of the massive undercount that will occur and how this is going to impact local budgets, how this is going to impact our parents and students in schools how this will impact states, how will this impact redistricting in a, a, a proportionment. And so I, I think we have to be very thoughtful that this administration inherited a mess, that our community is still living in fear, and that we have a lot of work to do. And my hope is that, you know, this administration will be even more aggressive in the solutions that they put forward. I just want to, you know, I echo those sentiments and I just want to add a quick point, you know, I think many of us um, have been fighting for right greater representation in government and specifically with the new administration, seeing that representation bear out in, you know, the new administration and the appointments they make. So, you know, yes, that is a very important component of making sure that our communities are a part of the decision making process and you want that representation to be as broad and diverse as possible. So that means, you know, appointing a wide variety um, individuals from, you know, a wide variety of backgrounds of experiences um, and of races and ethnicities. And so, you know, while we fight for that, I think what you at least and and Cindy have really pointed out is that it also needs to be paired with meaningful real action that is responsive to the realities that we are facing um, as a country and as a population and all of the complexities that come with that and all of the barriers that are existing for different parts different subpopulations of the Latino population. And so, you know, we really have to, we are all working very hard to make sure that the administration hears what those concerns are, that they know what the policies um, need to be, but it is going to be up to 
you know, this administration to make sure that they are listening to those voices, that they are really taking in what it is that needs to be done and making, you know, those really difficult but necessary steps to move our government forward. These are not going to be easy decisions to make, mostly because of the, you know, you know, because a lot of them are going to be challenging um, the structural powers, right, of our government. Um, but it really is going to be very essential that we see the administration take very bold steps um, in many areas of our lives to make sure that we're getting meaningful representation, but also that our, that our um, you know, as you asked, that the intersectional identities that we have as a population, as Latinos, are being reflected in the, um, you know, the actions, the policies, the um, decisions that they're taking. And so, you know, I, I think that we're, it's up to all of us to hold them accountable um, to the needs that we have and to hold them accountable to the, you know, not just the promises that they have made, but really to the progress that we need to see in this administration to build the foundation for progress in the next administration. Um, and so, you know, it is about representation, but it's very, very much about policy. Um, I'll add really quickly to Tendra's point. I think, um, you know, historically there have certainly been Latinx voices that powerful political figures have chosen to elevate over others. Right. And, you know, it's usually what's more politically convenient uh, for, you know, the administrations or uh, the people serving us in Congress. And so, you know, those voices could typically um, in the past, it's been Cuban voices or, you know, Latinos who are coming from more left wing countries that, um, you know, are undergoing some sort of dictatorship or um, authoritarian regime. But when it's you know, a right wing <laughs> uh, figure with authoritarian tendencies, we tend to look the other way. And, um, you know, so I think that is also something that we have to be, you know, the administration really needs to be honest about, you know, our role in Latin America throughout history. Um, and I also think that from a human resources standpoint, uh, we definitely need to increase or the administration needs to increase um, you know, the people, the, the number of diverse Latinos in, uh, in, in government, right, in leadership roles. Um, who are the policy advisors? Where are these Latinos coming from? Are they only from, you know, one particular region or are they representing, you know, the diverse region of Latin America, right? We, we need Mexican, Cuban, Venezuelan, Central American, Caribbean uh, Latinos in leadership roles in government. Um, and so, you know, one of the things that I've, you know, really struggled with, you know, as I apply for federal government jobs is they always ask us, they always ask us to, you know, report our ethnicity, right? But we never get a report back on how many people they've hired from, you know, the Black community, the Asian community, the Latino community. And so I'm a little frustrated at this point, and I don't really want to fill these out anymore until I get that data back. And so if we're going to continue to provide this data, we need to see, you know, more transparency within the administration of, you know, how many people of color are, you know, in these leadership roles. And I think one of the other ways to, you know, increase diversity um, in government and federal government is to increase wages, right? And, you know, even though Congress is more diverse than it's ever been, congressional staffers uh, do not look like the constituents that these members are representing. And so I think, there's a leadership role that the president can play here as well. Um, and I think, you know, making it, making these employment opportunities more equitable by providing a real living wage uh, for people in DC um, would make a huge difference because then you're expanding the, the, you know, the diverse voices that are advising leaders in government. And I would just add to that question, Laura, that not only can the president play an important role, but also the secretaries that lead the different departments and agencies. And one trend that I'm already seeing is that many of them have their diversity, equity, inclusion officers reporting directly to them. 
and that sends a strong message throughout the entire department and agency of how important this particular issue is. And the truth is, Jade, that we have a lot of work to do, right? We know that data drives policy. And even when we look not only at employment of our communities of color within government, but you start looking at supplier diversity, there is a reason why we're not tracking by race and ethnicity, which is something that LULAC is pushing. We're waiting to have a meeting with uh, the incoming SBA administrator, because we absolutely want to make sure that our government tracks not only employment by race and ethnicity, but also supplier diversity to understand how much wealth, how much income is also going back into our communities of color. Thank you all so much for your thoughtful reflections. Um, one topic that Cindy brought up in her remarks earlier was immigration from the region. And that has been so far one of the administration's priorities as they started their term. They've made it clear from day one by, for example, creating a task force to reunite separated families and by gradually beginning to end the migration protection protocols, also known as the Remain in Mexico policy. How can the Biden-Harris administration implement immigration reforms to address regional migration in an orderly, efficient, and humane manner? And how can the administration ensure that the unique needs of migrant children, women, and the LGBTQ community are met? I can start again. Um, so in terms of implementing immigration reforms, um, in an orderly, efficient, and humane manner. Immigration, yes, it's a complicated issue, but in my personal opinion, I think we need to be smarter and we need to not be um, too fearful um, when it comes to tackling these issues head on. Um, I believe that there is a way to engage with the communities. For example, the MPP protocols, um, I learned that the administration was not consulting with the nonprofits and the expectation was that the nonprofits were going to cover the costs of, you know, bringing these migrants and finding shelter, transportation. And I understand, you know, we have a lot of challenges. We are inheriting a big mess and we are also trying to do our best with the staff situation, right? But, um, we need more outreach and more funding, more smart use of funding so that we don't put that burden on the nonprofits that are willing to work with, with us for MPP protocols, um, you know? And um, instead of tiptoeing and instead of uh, being a little shy and being a little, oh no, this can happen and we can bother this person or we might lose, you know, the majority here. How many times are we going to get the perfect um, you know, trifecta after a very messy administration to push for our reforms. Um, right now, we're seeing a lot of political debate about immigration and the Dream and Promise Act and the Farm Workforce Act and then the immigration reform bill that um, President Biden has, you know, written. And we're still tiptoeing around it. We're still being a little hesitant and a little fearful. Um, and there's a smart way to do things. Just, I would encourage them to use their political capital to just go for it instead of being in our leaders as well to just, you know, we're in the majority, behave like it. Um, you know, we're, you're a democratic president and behave like it um, and find the, find the solutions, find the, the, the strategy. And in terms of the unique needs of migrant children, um, our administration spends so much money on so many different things. And one of them, including the Department of Defense, for example. Um, and I have toured personally many of these facilities. And there is a way that we can do this. There is a way that we can implement humane standards of care so that they can contract, for example, with you know, a care, um, a medical professional to be on site 24 seven, or at least on call 24 seven to address these needs. Uh, we can provide them with, you know, food. We should provide them with um, age-appropriate um, shelter instead of holding people, um, you know, all in one cell. I remember when I went, um, they had people just like on top of each other. They had like a little silo. They didn't have a bathroom. 
um, they were bare food and there was a woman who was, you know, asking for a little bit of water for her son. Um, and the, you know, it was, it was a terrible thing. And I think that now we're, we're, we're in charge, we're in the majority where, you know, we need to pay attention to finding creative ways of funding that's, you know, funding or finding that contract or fighting, finding that, you know, organization. And we have the resources, we have nonprofits who are willing to work with them. We have, you know, a lot of different ways that we can achieve that goal, that we can take care of migrant, you know, children and women and families. Um, and also listen to the to the experts, listen to the people that are on the ground, listen to the organizations that are, you know, on the ground, the lawyers, the attorneys who are defending these people um, day to day. Um, me personally, that's where my go to place to go find information and find solutions as well, because they are the ones that talk to the you know, migrants who talk to the detainees, find the, you know, loopholes, find the solutions, find like this officer is doing this X, Y, and Z. This is a period of time where we can be doing X, Y, and Z. Um, you know, get they, they, they have the information and we have to work with them um, in, in a very harmonized way. So that would be my take on how they can, you know, ensure these protocols are, and, and at some point we need to also push for and compromise, you know, work with Congress, but also compromise a little bit so that we can push for bigger and actual change in humanitarian, you know, standards of care. It's, I, I think it's very important because these lives, these people were dying. There were, there was a time where we had children dying in the, you know, custody of the federal government. And that, that, that inhumane policy, we cannot be rolling back. We need to be a little bit more brave and find the solutions and find the strategy. Um, so that's my two cents. I would just add, I, I think that's so well said, Ivelisse, and in terms of just uh, making sure that we understand our power, right? And, and certainly as someone who has been inside of the belly at the Democratic National Committee, worked under the under the Obama administration, I, I can certainly tell you that, you know, we were hoping that immigration reform would happen under President Obama, and it did not. And understanding one that, you know, the makeup of Congress is important, but also understanding that it's going to take all of us to make sure that we get immigration reform over the line. And, you know, the great thing is that we already have so many different bills that are being introduced or that have been introduced, whether it's the American Dream and Promise Act or whether it's the Farm Worker Workforce Modernization Act or whether it's just the bill that was just introduced by Senator Padilla, the Citizenship for Essential Workers Act. Uh, so certainly there's a lot of good legislation that is already in. And I think, you know, as, as we look at solutions, I, I just want us to, I, I want to remind us that we have seen better ways in past years. And I directly benefited from that because when my mom came into this country and documented with her two-year-old son and her one-year-old daughter, we were released into the community. And we know that America can do better. And what we have seen for the last four years has been a terrorizing strategy to place fear into our community, a community that already is fleeing violence, that is already fleeing persecution and fleeing so many other factors that keep the knee of oppression on our communities across the country. Um, certainly, I would say that Laura, one trend that we have seen is that so many of the community local organizations, Ivelisse, Jade, Andrea, that have been doing this work year in and year out are going out of business because they're not being funded, because they don't have the resources coming in to continue to support um, our different brothers and sisters who are fleeing this violence and who seek this protection and safety from the US. And I also want to make sure, and we've had different conversations with the administration, that you know we are provide, providing those basic needs, not only in terms of education, in terms of structure and schedule uh, for our youth and our, our youngsters, but also in terms of food. And you know, like I, I was thinking about this the other day. My mom made you know like our Sunday sopa, our Sunday soup traditional. And after three days, I don't want to eat it, right? But can you imagine? our communities who are in these different detention centers eating the same food day in and day out. 
and the impact that that's having on them also being behind sales and you know having toward the detention center in El Paso I can tell you we weren't even able to touch you know all we could do with uh, the individuals that were there all I could do was literally do like a heart with my hands to let them know that from afar I love them and that I am doing everything in my power to make sure that they are released into the communities where they belong. Um, and so certainly, Ivelisse, I so agree with you 100%. We could be much more aggressive and we will have to be much more assertive in terms of the strategies that we take on to make sure that we finally get immigration reform through the, the finish line. I just, you know, I think it's so important to underscore the need for bold action, as you've heard from both Cindy and Ivelisse, you know, the this is not the time to um, hide behind, you know, I think old, um, the old framework for how these discussions have usually traditionally gone and the limitations that, you know, frankly, um, other people have been putting into this discussion. I mean, our immigration system has long been discriminatory and biased against non-white Im immigrants. And so until we kind of really realize that and come uh, come towards, you know, bringing solutions that are, recognize that bias and the need to address that in our immigration system, you know, from the heart on out, um, you know, I think that you know, it's going to be very difficult, right, to see changes have a real effect on the way that um, our country deals with immigration. And so, you know, it means it means bold, vast reform. And we have to, you know, be ready for that. And specifically, we need to make sure that this administration, this Congress, that the elected officials that, you know, are being um, elected into office are ready to make that happen. Um, and so a lot of that is on the community and us as, you know, civil rights advocates, as, um, you know, immigration advocates, um, however you're coming into this discussion to make sure that we're pushing these issues um, and to make sure that we are getting the most change that we possibly can. But it does mean that we need to be working towards very bold reform. I think, um, you know, as a policy analyst, my response is really going to be focused on, on policy. And so I think first we have to reform our, you know, refugee. Um, this can happen on an, a national level, but it definitely needs to happen on a national level. But we need to reform our refugee and asylum law, uh, asylum laws, because, you know, for example, a Guatemalan that uh, maybe experiencing poverty uh, or food insecurity may travel north uh, to the United States. Um, and in the news, we'll, we'll uh, see them being characterized as climate refugees, right? Um, because they're, the reason they don't have any food uh, is because they are living off of the land and climate change is affecting, you know, their, um, their food and their, uh, you know, the whole agriculture system in this country. And so, even though we're, we call them climate refugees, that's not coded under any sort of international or United States law. And so we really need to um, reform those laws. Uh, same thing with you know, people in Central America fleeing gang violence. Uh, they don't have the same protections as people that may be fleeing, uh, you know, that may be fleeing uh, political persecution, for example. Uh, I also think that we need to increase legal pathways for entry and citizenship. Um, I, I know last week the the Biden administration announced that they were giving TPS to Venezuelan immigrants. Um, you know, Central Americans, uh, Central American immigrants have had TPS for you know nearly twenty years now, and they still fear deportation. Um, you know, especially in the last administration when um, the president announced that he would take away TPS from you know thousands of vulnerable uh, Central American immigrants. Um, I also think foreign policy is really important. Important, um, you know. I think the administration, uh, like the Obama administration, administration tried to do um, in 2015, 2016, uh, you know, invest in local and national solutions and have the State Department lead in these efforts. Um, I think, you know, we the Obama administration, this didn't go through Congress, but he proposed 
uh, $750 million to Central America uh, governments uh, to address the gang violence that was happening uh, at that time, you know, invest in education and employment opportunities. But there's also a lot of corruption <laughs> and a lot of, you know, human rights abuses that are occurring in, in these countries by the federal government. And so we also have to, um, you know, if we're going to invest in these countries, we also need to, you know, remind them that human rights is very important to us. And, um, and lastly, I just want to say that, you know, our immigration policies do not exist on, in a vacuum. Um, and they're not just happening in the border. We have built as a country, as a government, we have built this massive deportation machine. And that's also impacting millions of people, <laughs> you know, every day. I'll say that for me personally, um, my father is Dominican. He came to the United States when he was four years old and he was deported when I was a kid. Um, and so I lived, you know, I grew up without having, um, you know, a father here in the United States. That's not just, you know, Affect, that didn't only affect my emotional and mental development, right? That also affected my financial um, security growing up, right? That's one income that's lost. And when you deport parents, <laughs> immigrant parents of American uh, kids, that also, that's another, you know, another layer to this story. Um, uh, you know, I'm really the harmful immigration uh, policies. Thank you all so much for sharing your insights, your ideas, and your, your personal stories um, and the ways that you've been impacted um, by our immigration policy in the US. Earlier, Jade, Andrea, and Cindy all discussed the importance of representation, both in the administration and in Congress. And this month is Women's History Month, which is a time to celebrate women's contributions to the US, but also a time to reflect on the ways that we must continue to, um, to fight to advance to finally achieve uh, gender equality for everyone in the US. Latina women make just 55 cents on average for every dollar earned by a white man. What are the effects of this pay gap for Latina women and for their communities? And what policies should the Biden-Harris administration implement to close this pay gap and to ensure that all Latina women, including undocumented women, hourly wage workers, and others deserve or receive the pay that they deserve? Um, well, Latinas in many families are the backbone of their households. Um, you know, there's a lot of um, people in our community that have single parent um, and especially low income um, farm worker, um, you know, someone that works in, a, in the domestic um, cleaning type of industry um or you know gardening um and that is that just only exacerbates the pay gap because that big of a gap you know remember we're the lowest paid in the you know list of women per race uh we're the lowest one right we make even less than asian white and black women um so that is felt the most in women who belong to the industries I mentioned, you know, in the beginning. That's felt the most by, you know, women who don't have a voice, uh, Latinas who are in the fields, Latinas who are, you know, cleaning houses, cleaning hotels, uh, who don't have anybody to uh, leave their children with. Um, and so in terms of policy, well, equal pay. Uh, you know, and, and go beyond just the corporate private sector. Um, you know, it, it goes, it takes a lot of, you know, only raising awareness, but also policy, um, real actual policy that makes it illegal and give them the tools to the workers to appeal that, to, to remediate that without the fear of retaliation um, at the workplace and in every single industry. Um, and also hourly wage workers, you know, we just had this whole reconciliation deal in the $15 minimum wage. Um, find creative ways to go around it. Don't give up. Uh, keep working with all the stakeholders, keep working with Congress to make sure that that minimum wage, wage is raised, right? Because that only leads to more people um, depending, from, depending from the government. Um, that only leads to more homelessness that only leads to more poverty and that is felt in our communities the most. Um, and 
it, it's something that really, really deserves a lot of attention and a lot of um, creative ways. Again, I think uh, creative is a word I'm usually using a lot, but it's it's something that applies to my job, right? Like it's my job to find creative ways to achieve things that um, to to do actual change, to affect actual change, and. Um, I think the administration has a big responsibility here to address, you know, the mess that they have been, you know, inherited, but also a great opportunity to pass this, you know, bold action that we were talking about earlier uh, for workers, for Latinas to close the wage gap and uh, provide them the tools, fund, provide funding to the, you know, nonprofits or to the grassroots communities that are, you know, nearby these communities to give them counseling, to give them, you know, legal advice on how to fight this, on how to, uh, you know, provide them a, a, a tool to remediate the situation. Um, I think those are two important aspects of the gender page, uh, pay wage gap in the Latino community. Thank you for that question, Laura. And, and to expand on what Valise is saying, you know, I want to give you two statistics to, to think about. One, that currently 8.8% of unemployment um, is for Latinas. So 8.8% of Latinas are employed in this moment in time compared to 5.5% of Caucasian women. Um, and then that in January, nearly 80% of the 346,000 jobs that vanished from the US labor force impacted women, the majority being women of color. And as we start looking at what this moment in time means for our community. So I, I want you to think about the compounding effect. You already have Latinas who are earning less than 55 cents a dollar to what a Caucasian counterpart would earn doing the same exact job. Now you have unemployment rate and you also have the fact that Latinas are not being hired back at the same rate as their other counterparts and, fear, and peers. And then we, let's start talking about retention rates, right? And actual growth within government or companies and even the different sectors across America. And, you know, certainly uh, Laura, when I think of the pay inequity that exists, this is a form of oppression. Poverty keeps our communities oppressed. And I will tell you as someone that cleaned houses alongside my mother, I saw how hard my mom worked every single day to make sure that she could provide for us. And, you know, she always told me that my education was my wealth and that was the only inheritance that she could give me. And I think so many of us are in that same boat where our parents are working in the fields, they're working blue collar jobs simply to provide the very basics for their children. And although I grew up in poverty, Laura, I grew up picking up cans in the streets of Los Angeles. I grew up working alongside my mother. I never knew that I was poor. I just knew that my parents loved me and that they were doing their best to provide for me. And I was very fortunate that I grew up in a household where our values, where we centered our household on values, respect for others, basic human dignity, and understanding that our differences should be appreciated. And so I say that because as I think of the future of America, there is so much that this administration can do to make sure that Latinas get paid equitable wages. One of them is immediately assessing our federal government employees and seeing if our women are being paid the same as their male Caucasian counterparts. That's something that immediately can happen now. Um, I would say, you know, another thing to consider is making sure that we have programs that upskill and reskill our communities. We're living in a transformative era where we're living with technology and broadband and AI and so many things that are happening at this very moment. So we know that as companies and as the government transitions to innovative strategies and innovative technology, we need to make sure that our communities are being upskilled and reskilled. And then I would say also boldly invest and our small businesses, right? And by boldly, I don't mean just a few million dollars. I mean, this, this has to be an aggressive investment to make sure that our small businesses are being transformative. And what we saw with the PPP program, which sought to help our communities is that it did not work. 
because so many in our community and so many of the businesses did not have that basic infrastructure, something as simple as having a business account versus a personal account. And simply for that fact, they were left behind or simply not knowing where do I apply. And oftentimes the challenge is that we only use online websites, not understanding what, that one in three Latinos do not have access and technology or broadband. And then you start thinking about adoption and computer literacy and how this impacts the small businesses who may not be able to jump on a computer fill out an application and make sure that they're tracking all the records to be able to submit it back to the administration. This is where we need thoughtful leadership to understand the realities that so many of our community and our businesses face. And I, I couldn't agree more, Ivelisse. I mean, like, I think this reflects, this made me reflect on how creative our mujeres poderosas have always been, how creative uh, we have always been in terms of using the small uh, wages that we have to provide for our families. And also this also I think impacts why so many Latina women are creating small businesses because they are not finding those opportunities in a traditional workplace setting. And so I, I do think there's ample room here where we can grow. I also wanna point out that it's so important that we also highlight the issue of representation. And what we saw in California where they passed a bill to increase gender equity in corporate boards that are in California is that of the 511 seats that opened up, only 17 seats went to Latinas in a state where we are 40% of the population. And so clearly, even when you have policies in place, we have a lot of work to do to make sure that Latinas are at the table. We are less than 2% of women who serve on corporate boards and are in the C-suite section of private corporations. And that's why LULAC is part of Latino Voices for Boardroom Equity, because we need to make sure that companies understand that we are keeping an eye on them. We are tracking them. We are seeing how they market to our community, profit from our community, but yet, do not have representation of our communities at the highest level. And it's not enough to issue a statement during Hispanic Heritage Month. It's not enough to issue a statement that you believe in diversity, equity, and inclusion when you can't walk the walk and make sure that those numbers to include our community is actually present at all levels of the corporation and of government. So Cindy has you know, very eloquently, I think, laid out so many of the um, problems and the solutions that we need. Um, yes, equal pay is critical, um, but we have to, you know, as Cindy has discussed, we have to go far beyond that. We need to make sure that um, we are increasing the minimum wage, that we are, um, that our government is more aggressively addressing sex-based discrimination in the workplace, that there is guaranteed paid sick and family leave, um, and that, you know, there are, there are, you know, equal opportunities or better opportunities um, for uh, training and um, development for women in the workplace, um, and that we are looking at the issue more broadly because, you know, as Cindy has talked about us, Ivalice has talked about, you know, it's not just about the equal pay. There are so many aspects of our um, of our lives where um, inequity is baked into our experience. Um, and so making sure that, yes, you are receiving equal pay for equal work is essential. It also means making sure that you have the opportunity to work, um, that you have access to support systems for childcare so that you can work um, or so that you can take leave and take um, you know, the time that you need to do what you need to do outside of your work, whether that's you know, caring for your family, um, addressing other things in your life that must get done and making sure that you know, we all have equal access to that and that you know, making those decisions about you know, caring for a loved one who may need um, assistance doesn't compromise your ability to earn a living decent wage. You know, we're having a discussion now about raising the minimum wage and that itself doesn't, you know, 
while raising the minimum wage so people can live um, apparently is a controversial issue when it really shouldn't be. But it is also, you know, that's a, also a gender issue. Um, and it's also one that, you know, affects, you know, races and ethnicities differently, our identities differently. I mean, we've talked, you know, you've, we've talked at length about the um, pay gap that exists for Latinas specifically. If you break that down further, I'm sure you will find, as Ivalice has discussed, if you break that down by sector, it's going to be worse than what we're seeing in the data. If you break that down by subgroup, it'll be worse than what you're seeing in the data. Um, and so, you know, Afro-Latinas, Indigenous Latinas, um, you know, if you break that all down, you're going to see a, a, I think, a different picture of just the one number that we're capturing. Um, and that's why it's so important that we're making sure that all of these other policies, all of these other um, solutions need to be part of the mix because as Cindy has eloquently discussed, we have to be addressing the underlying issues of poverty and exploitation um, in order to get to a solution that really provides not just equal pay, but equity in the workplace for everybody. Um, one, I just wanna say, I really love this conversation because <laughs> y'all are all saying everything that I've been thinking. And so I'm really just echoing a lot of what um, each of you have said uh, so eloquently. Um, but, you know, I think Latinas have seen the worst employment rates um, out of every demographic uh, since COVID started. And, and that's not by accident, right? And so I think one of the ways, I'm gonna go back to policy, but you know, minimum wage is important, right? When we talk about the overrepresentation of Latinos and Latinas in, um, in the essential workforce <laughs> who are making poverty wages, who don't have paid leave, who don't have health insurance, uh, that policy failure is not an accident. That is by design. And it's because of the people that are, you know, in these leadership roles in the government private and even non-governmental sectors, right? And so um, I think we really do need to, there's two sides of the story, right? There is the equal pay and then there's the, um, you know, increasing the minimum wage so people are not living in extreme poverty, which is a serious issue here in the United States, right? Like if you look at the, the lines for the food banks, they are people of color, the majority. If you go to New York City and you go to these lines, they're largely undocumented workers. And so in addition to increasing the minimum wage, we have to really expand labor protections for, um, for all immigrants, right? Authorized and undocumented. And so that's something that, you know, for some reason is not like politically convenient for Democrats to do. But when you think about it in the long term, it only makes us a better, it only makes us better. It only makes us stronger. It only makes us safer. Um, you know, I think, like I said earlier, we're overrepresented in our country's prisons in our detention centers. Uh, we're overrepresented in COVID deaths. We're overrepresented in unemployment rates. And, but we're underrepresented in leadership roles, right? Across all sectors. And we're underrepresented in those powerful tables where the people are making decisions. And so I think, you know, we've said this throughout the entire uh, panel, but we need more representation of Latino Latinos in positions of power. Um, and I also think that the way we hire uh, you know, people of color or anybody in this country, you know, we, we expect people to check a certain box. And so if we want people in you know, staffing Congress or you know, policy advisors in, um, in the White House of you know, different ethnicities and different races, we're usually seeing if they check certain boxes, right? Did they, did they intern here? Did they, were they a staffer there? And a lot of these um, positions are often unpaid or they're, very, you know, they're low paying jobs. So if you don't check that box because you had to work one summer in college to pay for college, <laughs> um, then you kind of miss an opportunity, right? Because we all know that a lot of these positions are through who you know. And if you can't actually make it to DC for an unpaid internship, or for you know, a salary as a staffer of $20,000, $30,000 a year, then you just lost out on so many potential opportunities uh, in the long term. And so I really think that we have to think about like what is quality experience, you know, and really, you know, really betting on people of color to do these jobs 
because at the end of the day, we know our communities better than the people that are often representing us. Before we move from this subject, Laura, I, I would just mention one other issue, which I think it's important. And it's the fact that we have a lot of work to do around the issue of mental health and making sure that the administration looking you know, within HHS, um, hopefully incoming Secretary Becerra, how can we make sure that there's more mental health resources available for vulnerable communities? And why I mention this is that as we continue to look at the rise of unemployment rates within the Latina community as well as women in general, we know that so many women are having to make the hard decision of leaving the workforce so that they can care for their children and their loved ones. Um, and for the single mothers and for the Latinas that have to work, I just want you to imagine, and I hear these scenarios all the time from educators and individuals who are working within our school system, where children, are, the smaller children are being left alone with their older sibling, who by the way, is also trying to go to school at the same time. Or you see families who are self evicting. And so now you have three to four families in a two bedroom home because the housing prices and the rent and mortgages are so high that all they can afford is a room in a two bedroom house or maybe even just the, the living room within a home for their entire family. And I just want us to really think about what this means, not only in the short term, but what this means for our Latinas in the long term, the levels of anxiety and stress and also what impact this is going to have on our children, on our future leaders as we move forward. If I can just add really quickly to, to what Cindy said, I think we also have to recognize that poverty is a mental health issue, right? Depression, anxiety, stress, all of that impacts our mental health. And a lot of that is driven from not, you know, from this financial insecurity, right? And if you look at the numbers, we have a lot of reasons to feel insecure financially, and that's creating all of these other mental health issues in our families. Ivelisse, did you want to add something? Um, no, I was going to comment that it's also to keep our um, employers and leaders accountable, um, because it's not only enough to appoint a brown person, it's not only enough to hire a brown person or to put them you know, at the top and for them not to do anything. It's about having a plan, having a strategy and following up with that. Following up with having a, a fair representation and holding that person you know, accountable to provide fair wage, to provide, to hire more you know, people of color. Um, and I think also awareness. I think a lot of people we know we know because we're in industry that Latinas are the lowest paid, but a lot of people don't know that. And a lot of people don't, I think our, our diversity conversation in the United States is very much black and white and we need more you know, um, intersectionality to the conversation of unequal pay. Thank you all so much for your responses and thanks to Ivelisse and Andrea for bringing up the wide range of structural solutions that are really necessary in addition to equal pay, of course, that Latinas desperately need. And thank you to Cindy and Jade for speaking about the ways that COVID-19 has disproportionately affected Latina women and also the negative health impacts that's had on women and children and continues to have. I do have one final question for you all before we turn to audience questions. So a January report published by the UCLA Latino Policy and Politics Initiative determined that Latinx voters were crucial in helping elect President Joe Biden to the White House. Nationwide, in 2020, Latinos cast 16.6 .6 million votes, which is an increase of 30.9% over the 2016 presidential election. What forms of outreach and engagement with the Latinx community helped ensure this turnout? And how can we continue working to ensure that all Latinx eligible voters are informed and registered to vote in elections to make their voices heard? I can kick it off, Laura, with that question. Um, and folks know that in a former life, I, I did civic engagement, organizing and mobilizing. And so this is 
a, a clear passion of mine, even though I, you know, for, for so many years, I've been in the pipeline to become a U.S. citizen. And so just know that I, I want to be a U.S. citizen more. And I, I said it before I got married, I wanted to be a US, U.S. citizen more than what I wanted to get married. And it's actually still true today. Um, and, you know, what I would say, Laura, is that por fin, right? Like, alas, um, our political structure understands that we are not a monolith and that Latinos in America um, have different experiences, vote in very different ways, but yet the majority still work, vote for progressive values. And so, you know, a Latino that is in Florida is very different from a Latino or Tejano in Texas, from a Chicano, from someone that's in California, from an immigrant that's a new American. And certainly our voting pattern is impacted not only by geography, by age, by gender, by income, by education, which by the way are also factors that impact the general population. And so what I would say, Laura, you know, some of the best practices that I saw and the last um, elections is we saw several campaigns who intentionally made sure that Latinos were incorporated at all levels of their political structures. And, you know, one campaign that comes top of mind is the Bernie Sanders campaign. As everyone knows, Bulak is nonpartisan. We do not endorse. And, but we do observe and obviously we get engaged in making sure that our community turns out regardless of who they support. Uh, but certainly I was impressed by the fact that we had Latinos in the inner circle of the candidate. We had Latinos who were being hired at all levels um, of the campaign. And you know, as it became clear that Biden uh, was the, the, the front runner, we started seeing those changes within the Biden campaign and making sure that more Latinos and Latinos were being hired as well. Um, I will tell you, Laura, that, you know, like, I, I do think that we finally understood that messaging matters and there are small nuances that matter a lot. If you're targeting a Cuban population versus like Cuban ancestry, you know, versus a Mexican American sixth generation, uh, Tejano, or, you know, whether you're targeting a new American immigrant in the DMV area, um, certainly making sure that the voices of the community were uplifted was very important, but also making sure that there were key leaders who were involved in the planning and strategy uh, was also very important. As someone that started in campaigning way back when Kerry ran for president, um, I can tell you at that time, as the only Latina always in the room, and even at the Democratic National Committee, the only Latina as part of the senior staff, um, you know, I would say we can't be the only ones. And I think this is a point that was brought up by all of um, the individuals here, by Jada, Valise, and Andrea, that it's not enough to have one person in the room, right? Because you would get shut down. It's important that we build that infrastructure of support and also have that pipe down. Um, I will tell you, Laura, that one of the, the things that certainly I noticed was an increase in investment um, going to not only hiring, but also marketing and outreach um, that was very important. So one, you have to invest and understand that our communities sometimes is standing on the sidelines because you're not approaching us and asking matters. You have to ask us to vote for you. You have to earn our respect. You know, something where we have still ample room to grow is to not show up a few weeks before election day and ask us to cast our ballot for you. We have to date for a little while. We gotta know what you're about before we can marry you. Um, and so I, I want us to be very clear that for so long, we have been used to political uh, politicians showing up weeks, days before asking us for a vote, but yet never took the time to come to our communities to talk about the vision and future that they want to see, to make sure that they earn our vote. And then I would just end it with this. And it's that as Latinos, we give our power away. Close to 30 million Latinos are eligible to register to vote. Every 30 seconds, a Latino in the US is turning 18 and nine out of 10 are eligible to vote. And yet we saw about 17 million Latinos, which was an increase from previous years who turn out to vote. And I think that's an undercount because some states don't track uh, race and don't even track surnames. 
And so I think we certainly still have an opportunity. And what we know for sure is that when you invest, our community turns out to vote. When LULAC invested in our Latino community in Iowa to caucus, our community turned out to vote, right? They turned out to caucus in a state that traditionally you don't have more than one person of Latinos turn out to caucus. And so we know that if campaigns, political parties, candidates continue to financially invest, make sure that they're inclusive of having, you know, their kitchen roundtables include Latino voices to advise and guide them and make sure that the suppliers that they're bringing on, whether it's their media, marketing, creative, are actually Latino owned, that it goes a long way in actually the message reaching the community. I'm going to stop there because I could completely take over for the next 15 minutes, but I know that my counterparts want to add something more to this conversation. Thank you, Cindy. I actually, again, agree with you 100%. And I think to bring it back to my you know, answer to the first question, I think it's very important to do that outreach. It's very important to do you know, the homework on the fact that Latino communities are not the same. Um, and I'm not going to repeat everything you just said, even though I totally agree. But just, you know, as an example, when I first came to the US, um, I was so shocked by the fact that there were all of these um, assumptions that Hispanic or the Latino community was the same. Um, I remember I went to my neighbor who very, you know, she was very kind to invite us over for dinner and she was serving um, a, a special dish uh, that was from Mexico. And I had no idea how, you know, it tasted and I had already eaten before going there. And I was like, I'm so sorry, I'm gonna have to pass, which I, now I know it's like a sin in the Mexican community. Um, and she, her answer was, well, then que comes? If you don't eat Mexican food, then what do you eat? And inside of me, it was a rage, right? I was like, Peru is one of the culinary, you know, capitals in the world. <laughs> how can you ask me what I eat? But then, as I kept learning more about the Hispanic or Latino community in the United States, it's very usual, it's very easy to just put us all in one bag and generalize, you know, the little information that they have for our community in, in one thing. Um, so I, I agree with all of that. And to that, to add, I also think that we should um, encourage Latinos and Latinas to run for office. Um, I think it's, it's heavily, heavily, heavily important. And it's a huge responsibility because that's how we are gonna earn the trust of our community. That's, go, that's to, to just come, you know, to immigrate to the United States and see someone up there in some stage talking about the importance or Latino rights, labor rights, equal pay, and to see that they have the color of your skin, to see that they speak the language that you speak, it's powerful. Um, you know, that's exactly what happened to me when I came to the U.S. and I met Dr. Ruiz uh, and, you know, I'm from his district and that's exactly what happened. I saw, you know, a brown man who was speaking my language uh, giving a speech on campus to students and he was a member of Congress um, and he just gave me the hope that I needed uh, and the strength that I needed to invest myself, my whole, my soul, my heart into this country and, and engage in public service, right? So, and, and to want to vote. I also share seeing this, you know, feeling I could not wait when I was a permanent resident, I could not wait to become a citizen. Um, all of my peers and colleagues hate jury duty. I, I'm dying, I still haven't done it. And I'm dying to go and do jury duty. I was dying to, I was so anxious to vote. Um, I unfortunately couldn't vote for the 2016 election, but this election, I was voting in the local elections and the government elections and the state elections, all the elections, you know, Board of Education elections, I was there. And just to see more, you know, people of color, more people from our community up there in elected official positions is very powerful. So that's another important, you know, fact that I would um, highlight here in this conversation. I also, you know, I want to add that, yes, we saw um, a lot of great strides in terms of turnout, but we also have to remember the backdrop that, you know, our elections were running in, and that's that this is the second presidential election that happened without the full protections of the Voting Rights Act. 
So you had no preclearance in the states that would have previously been required to, um, you know, get permission for election changes to make sure that they were not discriminatory. Um, this will be the first uh, cycle of redistricting, the one that is coming up, without the protections, the full protections of the Voting Rights Act, because we do not have, you know, preclearance effectively in place. Um, after the 2013 Shelby County versus Holder decision from the Supreme Court. And so, you know, we saw those great strides in many of our communities, um, despite the fact that voter discrimination is still happening today um, and that people have to kind of um, overcome all of these challenges to being able to register to vote and then to be able to go and cast their ballot, whether that was through, you know, an in-person, um, doing it in person or through the mail. And, you know, COVID-19 presented a lot of challenges for people to cast their ballots um, in this election. And, and fortunately, we saw that people made, you know, made use of the opportunities that were available to them through mail voting or early voting or, um, you know, voting in person, um, you know, to the best that they could. And, and, you know, that does also shows you the importance of all of these different um, policies that make voting more accessible for everybody and how necessary they are. Um, but it does mean that we have to be working very hard um, to make sure that we are pushing for um, those policies to, you know, to remain. And we are seeing now this huge backlash against, um, you know, voter accessibility. You're seeing that with the le recent legislation coming out of Georgia, with the recent legislation out of Texas and those efforts to restrict the right to vote. And so, you know, I will just say how incredibly important it is that we have Congress focus on, you know, making permanent the protections of the right to vote and specifically that we, you know, um, use the opportunity that we have right now to push for um, the passage of the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act, um, which would restore, um, you know, preclearance, um, the preclearance process um, and allow for, um, you know, advocates and communities uh, to better address voter discrimination that is occurring now. Andrea, I just want to I just want to add that uh, the Washington Post reported that at least 250 new laws have been introduced in 43 states to limit mail, early in-person voting, and election day voting. And so we know that these um, voting restriction measures target Latino communities, Black communities, communities of color. Um, and so I think that is very telling, right? That all it's not just Republican-led states. All these states, 43 across the country, are introducing new laws. And it just kind of highlights the urgency to pass federal legislation that protect our, um, our right to vote. Um, I also want to say that um, I know we are talking about campaigns, but Biden is not on campaign right now. He's president, right? He's in the White House. And so I think his actions will speak louder than the words on the campaign trail come 2024. Um, and so I really think that his administration, if he wants to, I think a form of outreach is policy, right? I think he needs to focus on policy that benefits Latinos. I think that in my opinion, that's passing, you know, Medicare, signing Medicare for all into law. I know that that's not something that he has said he's willing to do, but as I feel like Latinos really resonated uh, Bernie Sanders' message really resonated with Latinos because he was advocating for Medicare for all. And we've seen during the COVID pandemic that having health insurance tied to employment is very detrimental to our communities. And so we really do need to, um, you know, have a piece of legislation that guarantees universal health care to all of us, right? No matter how much money we make, no matter where we're from, right? What zip code we live in. And, um, you know, I think investing in public education uh, in New York City, for example, 75% of public school students are Black and Latino. So, meanwhile, we've been seeing a divestment in our education budgets while we are increasing our, uh, you know, police budgets 
um, you know, ICE budgets and Border Patrol has increased and those have, you know, targeted our communities as well. And I also think, you know, implementing humane immigration policies at the border is important. But I also think that we need to dismantle the deportation machine that we've built uh, that have been separating families for decades. Um, I think we need to, you know, provide more pathways to citizenship. Uh, and, you know, I, I think about if we had passed some sort of immigration reform, uh, you know, in 2013, 2014, what would that have looked like in the polls in 2016, in 2020? Um, and then also Puerto Rico, <laughs> how do we treat Puerto Rico? And, you know, in 2020, they voted, um, the majority of voters in Puerto Rico voted for statehood. And, you know, we can have difficult conversations about that and what that means, but we need to have serious conversations. You know, 3 million people on the island do not have representation uh, in our federal government, cannot vote for president. And so, you know, I think that also needs to be a conversation that happens in Congress um, and in the White House, uh, you know, within the first term. Um, and I guess I'll leave it at that. Um, I will say that Latino voters are younger. Um, you know, we're gonna see a lot more Latino voters coming out. I, I know Cindy uh, gave the statistics, uh, but that's also true, right? A lot of children of immigrants are coming of age right now. And so we really need to, and also millennials are officially the uh, largest voting block in the country right now. And so we need to be addressing the issues that are important to millennials and Gen Z, right? And so that's employment, that's student debt, <laughs> that's immigration policies, that's education policies, it's everything, right? And so we need to be more holistic. Um, our government needs to be more holistic in how they address the issues facing the Latino population. I would just add louder, and I know that we're running out of time, two points. One, that we need to recognize the role that we have as individuals, as constituents of this country and hold elected officials accountable who are persecuting our children at the border, but are neglecting to persecute the insurrectionists that storm our capital just a few months ago. And so I, I want us to also be bold as individuals and in tracking and putting in check those elected officials who again are harming our communities and yet are turning an eye away from hate crimes and individuals that only seek to divide our country. And then the last point that I would add is that it's so important that we recognize how diverse our communities are and the intersectionality. You know, I know that we don't have a voice of our Afro-Latinx community represented in this discussion, but we have to understand that Hispanic is an ethnicity and within that ethnicity, we have multiple races, including Black. And that racism is a real issue in America, as we have seen with Black Lives Matter, as we have seen with the deportations of our Black brothers and sisters into the Caribbean and other parts of the world. And so we have to also recognize that discrimination, racism does exist within the context of immigration as well. And thank you so much for the time. Dayanita. Thank you all. Okay. <laughs> well, it was a great honor to have you speaking during this uh, important and interesting uh, session. Laura, we have received many favorable remarks and questions. I don't know if you have uh, some words you want to mention something this time. We do. Um, I don't know if the speakers have to leave at 1.30. Okay. Okay, so we're going to send you the comments uh, and the questions as well. Uh, I hope we can arrange to have an, another uh, event in the near future with all of you. Uh, please uh, join our organization and stay tuned for our next monthly webinar. Also, we want to invite you to our annual celebration event. Uh, so please go to www.wecaps.org. Uh, caps.org and look there for our working groups, events, and how you can join uh, this organization. Thanks, uh, Bonnie Jenkins. I don't know if you can uh, listen to us. I, I see you there, but if you want to, to give us some words. 
Uh, no, this has been great. I've, I've listened with great interest. So thank you for doing this, Diana, and, and also for the amazing panelists. What a wonderful conversation. Um, so thanks for arranging this. Uh, thanks for taking the time, everyone, for doing this for a very instructive and informative conversation. And we will be posting this on the website as well as our YouTube channel. So thank you, Diana, and to everyone uh, for the working group to do this. Thank you, Ambassador Jenkins. And thank you again, Laura Munoz from the Center for Democracy in the Americas uh, for moderating this session. Thank you again to speakers. This was very compelling, informative, and inspiring panel. Um, we're going to we're going to see you soon. If you uh, need more information about our working group, I'm going to write here, uh, you know, in the chat, just the, the email, so you can send us your your thoughts or questions. Is there? Okay. Well, thank you, Laura. Thank you, Cindy, Ivelis, Andrea, Jade, Jade, and Bonnie, and all of you. That participate today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. bye.